My name is Connie Hassett. I'm a member of the Princeton Adult School Board, and it is my extreme pleasure to be welcoming you here this evening uh, to the Ann B. Shepard Lecture Series, The Victorian Era, the Past That Is Our Present. Our speaker this evening is Carolyn Williams, who comes to us from Rutgers University. You notice the beautiful color on our poster. That's Rutgers. Um, as she is chair of the English department. Uh, at Rutgers, in addition to being chair, Carolyn has served in many, many capacities. She's been the director of undergraduate studies. Uh, she's director of the reading series, uh, Writers at Rutgers. Uh, she is the executive director of Writers House. She is associate, has been associate director of the Center for the Critical Analysis of Contemporary Culture, known to some of us as CAC. Um, in addition uh, to Rutgers, Carolyn has also taught at Duke University, at Boston University. Uh, she's a very distinguished teacher, and she has garnered repeated teaching awards. The Scholar Teacher Award at Rutgers, the Warren Sussman Award for Excellence in Teaching, also from Rutgers, different year. These are spread out over a career. She didn't just have one hot year. She has repeatedly <laughs> good years. The Metcalf Award for Excellence in Teaching at Boston University. Uh, now you'll say, well, didn't she get one at Duke? Well, no, she wasn't there that long. But they actually flew her in from Princeton to North Carolina once a week to get her there to give this lecture course. Okay, They thought very highly of her. Carolyn's scholarly work has been recognized with many honors, including, and I'll just list some of them, a Guggenheim Fellowship Award, uh, Benjamin Beatrice and Richard Bader Fellowship in the Visual Arts of the Theater Collection at Harvard, uh, a fellow at Stanford University Humanities Center, an NEH Award, a Radcliffe Institute Fellowship, more properly known as a Mary Ingram Bunting Institute Radcliffe College Harvard University Fellow. Okay. <laughs> Carolyn has two books. Uh, the first is called Transfigured World, Walter Pater's Aesthetic Historicism from Cornell University Press. This met with extreme critical acclaim. I read reviews. We're in related fields. Carolyn got reviews to die for. Okay. Her new book just out, someone here this evening had a copy. Do you want to wave it so people can see it? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's called Gilbert and Sullivan, Gender, Genre, Parody from Columbia University Press 2011. I mean, this just, just came out. And if you are a Gilbert and Sullivan fan, there's a chapter in there on every single, all 14 of the Gilbert and Col Sullivan collaborations. Carolyn has also edited three major collections of essays. She's published nearly innumerable refereed articles, invited book chapters, commissioned pieces, and reviews. In addition to enhancing our understanding of the artists that she cares so much about, who are they? Walter Pater, Charles Dickens, George Meredith, Gilbert and Sullivan, Virginia Woolf. Carolyn's work has also contributed to the crafting of entire fields of literary scholarship. For example, I'll just give you two. Carolyn was a consultant to the Ford Foundation and produced for them a commissioned essay called What is Cultural Studies, which then became the focus for discussions, discussion groups of the foundation's new initiative called Crossing Borders, which would then uh, reshape the field of various fields of area studies. It was a seminal paper, in other words. Uh, Carolyn was also the guest editor and wrote the introduction for a special issue of Victorian Literature and Culture, the premier journal in our field. The topic was Victorian Studies and Cultural Studies. It included five essays, a forum with 14 commissioned papers, and these people developed the, the course of the discourse for the next decade. Projects like these are the deep background for much new scholarship, many exciting new college courses, as well as programs like our own Ann B. Shepard Lecture Series, The Victorian Era, The Past That Is Our Present. Car one more. Carolyn's next book, which is already in progress, is called The Aesthetics of Melodramatic Form. And it has some bearing on what you will hear from her tonight, because Carolyn's talk, as you probably know, is on Victorian melodrama, murder, and mayhem. Please welcome Carolyn Williams.
How's that? No. Now? How's that? Louder. Louder. And now? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, um, Connie, that was above and beyond, and I appreciate it so much. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm really, I'm really excited to be here. I've talked at, uh, at the Princeton Adult School before, and it's my, it's my favorite audience, and I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Princetonian, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I want to begin my talk by um, referring to a slide that I don't have. And that's because this morning I woke up with a, that eureka feeling of exactly how this talk should begin, but I didn't have the slide. Uh, and that would, would be a slide of Sweeney Todd. Uh, some of you may know uh, the Sondheim musical, Sweeney Todd, uh, and from 1979. And maybe you know the Johnny Depp, um, Helena Bonham Carter film of Sweeney Todd from 2007. But um, what we need to start with here is that that story was originally a serialized story in Victorian periodical press and then became a Victorian melodrama before it was even finished uh, in 1847. The story briefly told is that Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street, would um, kill uh, the clients in his barber chair flip a little lever and send them down to the cellar of his uh, building where his accomplice, Mrs. Lovell, would make meat pies out of them. And the reason I wanted to start here, even though I hadn't prepared a slide, is that my title announced in your brochure was Murder, Mayhem, and Melodrama. And I didn't have enough murder and mayhem in my talk. <laughs> so I thought I would begin there and get the murder and mayhem uh, started. Actually, melodrama deals with social disorder in a lot of ways, but it's not always about crime, uh, murder, and mayhem. Uh, so, what is melodrama? Uh, as the name suggests, it's drama accompanied by music, and it's especially um, uh, flourishing in the late 18th and all through the 19th century. It's drama with a certain uh, roster of character types that you all know. Uh, the villain, twirling his mustaches. The heroine, a victimized woman uh, under duress. And the hero, who is usually so good and so trusting that he's almost stupid. <laughs> he's very dense because he's so good. And, um, all of these uh, stock characters are recognizable visually. It's very important that in melodrama you can tell who's who by looking. It's a visual medium, originally developed for people who didn't necessarily read. And, um, and yet, uh, it has taught us a whole new set of visual literacies that we still are using today. These character types have become so familiar to you that you uh, are used to the, seeing them mostly in parody form. As for example, That's your basic trio. <laughs> the um, victimized woman, the villain, and the somewhat dense and good hero. Um, there are other character types that populate the melodrama too, such as the old man and woman who are uh, go uh, good um, tutelary figures, the comic man and woman who are usually members of the working classes and who um, back up the high romantic plot with a lower plot. And you can tell by that that English melodrama is um, very much influenced by Shakespeare. Uh, and that's really one of the things that makes English melodrama better than any other melodrama. Um, it's often said that good and evil are uh, graphically divided in melodrama. And that's true and yet not entirely true. At first, 
the villain and the hero are absolutely different. But later on in the 19th century, sometimes the protagonist and the villain are the same person. So as the talk goes on, I'll want to get closer to that conundrum. Uh, one of the most important things about melodrama for our culture, and I'm sorry, for the past that is our present, is the fact that melodrama morphs directly into cinema at the end of the 19th century. And a lot of the forms that you're used to, in, uh, that we're all used to, that we live among in uh, cinema and television uh, come straight from melodrama. And that, again, is something we'll get to later in the talk. We still live today, in other words, within the regime, the aesthetic regime of melodrama. Uh, and um, I'm going to try to say some things about what that means to us and why it's important. Um, but uh, just to give you a taste of what's coming, uh, a little bit of silent um, melodrama. Oh, sorry, this is, the, um, this is the actual melodrama from which that trope of being tied to the railroad tracks is taken. After Dark by Dion Boucicault in 1868. It just had such an enormous influence, and you can imagine why, because uh, the locomotive was a, um, maybe the most important industrial development in the 19th century. And here it is figured as a danger. Sound is not good, is it? That's okay. It's, it's the slide. No, it's the, really, it's just. <laughs> well, I played that for you just so you could also see the uh, intertitles flashing in between the scenes of the, um, of the melodrama. And we'll, uh, we'll get to that as well. OK, so but to go back a little bit to our central topic, which is Victorian melodrama. Uh, it, melodrama was the dominant form of theater in the 19th century. It derives from post-revolutionary French uh, melodrama. It, um, and I say post-revolutionary because it's very important that it deals with uh, the struggles of common people. Um, it, it's an egalitarian form. It's trying to educate its audiences to a whole new way of thinking about the world that's no longer aristocratic and based on status to which people are born, but is now um, egalitarian and based on class, which uh, is a category that's much more fluid. And people can rise and fall in class, uh, in class relations, whereas status relations are absolutely fixed. So that's why I emphasize that it's post-revolutionary. But it actually began with a lot of reenactments of the fall of the Bastille uh, in what were called the French rescue dramas. And that um, will ring a bell with you, too, because the rescue at the end of melodrama is such a, an important part. Um, there was also an additional influence from Germany during the Romantic or Sturm und Drang period, uh, especially Gothic influence with the um, specters and ghosts and dungeons and um, things like that. Um, the first melodrama can be credited to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So what the next point I want to make is that it's a post-enlightenment phenomenon, not just post-revolutionary, but post-enlightenment. And the main idea I want to get across uh, by saying that is that uh, it partakes in the disenchantment of the world, or the, the f um, failure in the 19th century to keep on believing as strongly as before in a providentially organized universe. This goes alongside with the post-revolutionary changes. So not only are social relations becoming more egalitarian and more fluid, and therefore, more, therefore less secure, but also um, belief in a providentially organized uh, universe is getting a little more shaky. And um, melodrama answers those problems uh, with its own plots. Rousseau's melodrama didn't have anything to do with these social issues. It was called Pygmalion. 
And it was a, it told the Pygmalion story. It was a one character melodrama, which is called a monodrama. And Pygmalion was that character. Standing in front of his statue of Galatea, he would uh, orate or declaim his feelings. And the whole arc of the drama was his change of feelings in relation to the statue. Um, and the big innovation that Rousseau thought about was to, to prefigure every single thing he said with a strain of music. So music would alternate with declamation. And uh, the music would start, then he would speak, the music would continue under his words, then it would stop, then he would stop, then a new strain would start, a new feeling would start, um, and so on. That is the form of melodrama. The music subtends a, a form of declamation, a very exaggerated form of speech that had its own pronunciation rules almost, and a very exaggerated gestural language, which you all, all know um, and we'll see again in a few minutes. So the way the music starts and stops uh, is just like a film score. And this is one thing I mean by saying we still live in the aesthetic regime of melodrama now. Our feelings are guided by the kind of music that plays behind the words of the drama. And you can always feel that, especially when the violins start and you know that your tear ducts are warming up. <laughs> you had Bar Barry last week, right? He, he always talks about a five hanky film. <laughs> Uh, anyway, the music guides your feelings and expresses them uh, and, and provokes them. So, melodrama came to England in the late 18th century and it flourished all the way through the 1880s um, and to some extent beyond. And as I said before, morphed into cinema at the end of the century. There are several uh, kinds of melodrama and I'm going to name six and just talk you through a little bit of the features of six. Early melodrama was divided between Gothic and nautical. Gothic melodrama, like Gothic literature, is um, about ghosts and the supernatural. And it always poses the question, what kind of supernatural force can be alive in this modern world? So. Um, in fact, it was a serious attempt, as I said before, to try to think of what sorts of supernature there would be. Um, Gothic melodrama often features a castle with a dungeon or with a secret passageways connecting various parts of it underground or with a family portrait gallery that uh, displays the lineage of a crumbling aristocracy. Um, but there were also more overtly supernatural Gothic melodramas as well, such as many, many melodramas of Frankenstein, the novel by Mary Shelley from 1818, and many, many uh, um, vampire melodramas. And um, I'll show you the vision scene from the beginning of The Vampire or The Bride of the Isles, which was an uh, 1820 melodrama by James Robinson Planchet. One thing that's interesting about this uh, scene is that, of course, the supernatural force is hovering above the sleeping woman. And he pronounces the very words that you'll hear from 100, 200, 300 melodramatic villains after him. She will be mine, all mine. Um, and in this case, it's no lie. I mean, he's really, he's planning to, um, he's planning to take her body and soul. Uh, interestingly enough, this kind of fanciful story uh, has its own serious purposes, and there was a lot of thinking back in the early 19th century, late 18th century, about the force of dreams and about the kinds of supernatural forces, or rather at least ir irrational forces, that could hover around a sleeping person and cause certain changes. This is the nightmare by... Uh, Henry Fuseli, and here is another painting uh, by Fuseli uh, called The Shepherd's Dream. There are a number of romantic paintings like this, and, um, 
and I'm showing them just to indicate that the vampire uh, has its roots in other forms of thinking about the same kinds of forces. The next kind of um, melodrama I want to talk about is nautical melodrama. And um, it, too, was an artifact of the first three or four decades of the 19th century. The important purpose of nautical melodrama, which always had to do with sailors or pirates, um, was to figure out what on earth had happened during the Napoleonic conflicts. You know, there were a series of huge naval battles um, and battles on land, but it was a, it was a very important naval campaign um, that lasted for a very long time, and it caused a lot of social stress, just like war always does, but in a particular way. Uh, the theaters were very um, hard at work producing plays that helped people think about the, the naval campaigns. For example, it, at Sadler's Wells, they had a gigantic amphitheater that they filled with water and reenacted many of the battles from the Napoleonic Wars. Um, reenactment can also be a form of melodrama that we sometimes still see today. But as you can see, people would be, they would be captivated by the spectacle because it would be a gigantic spectacle. But they would also be thinking about what the war meant and what the different battles meant in terms of their own national culture. Sometimes the nautical melodramas would deal with injustices that were suffered by sailors on board ship. Um, so for example, there are several mutiny melodramas. And if you think about mutiny on the bounty, you'll have a very good example of a mutiny melodrama. Um, a mutiny melodrama would be one where the common man is serving under an unjust naval authority, an unjust national authority. And if you think about it, you can see how radical that might be because it would teach the audiences to believe that the naval hierarchy could be unjust, which is an incendiary idea. Of course, it would always work out in the end so that ev ev everything smooths out again. But um, you can see why it would be a political form of drama. Matt, uh, we have residues of nautical melodrama with us still. Uh, in literature, like Billy Budd, um, and in the Ma Master and Commander series by Patrick O'Brien, which I'm sure some of you enjoy. These are form, forms still of thinking through those same wars, and, um, and it, in, a, of course, a nautical setting. I've brought um, slides of uh, Gilbert and Sullivan parodies of nautical melodrama. HMS Pinafore, of course, recycles a lot of the figures and tropes of nautical melodrama in a, in a humorous way. And um, the next slide I'm going to show you comes from an outlaw melodrama, a parody of an outlaw melodrama, The Pirates of Penzance. So we have Gilbert and Sullivan making fun of nautical melodrama in its serious form and nautical melodrama in its outlaw form. It's lawful form, it's outlaw form. Um, now, this is the parody rape scene from the Pirates of Penzance. And you may not have thought about it that way, but it is. Because one of the things about pirates was that they were supposed to be very sexy and very uh, dangerous. And it was a kind of a craze among feminine readers especially, because it was thrilling to be uh, abducted by a pirate. You can tell that's true because in Jane Eyre, um, Jane's chief rival, says, oh, I do dote on Corsairs. Um, so uh, anyway, to be abducted by a pirate was an attractive thing in some ways. And this Gilbert and Sullivan scene makes fun of that um, because Mabel says, hold, monsters. Though your pirate caravans array proceed against our will to wed us all, just bear in mind that we are wards in chancery, and Father is a major general. So in other words, the pirates are going to wed them all. And that's, that's Gilbert and Sullivan's little joke about pirate melodrama. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> so it's great. It's a very hi hyperbolic recitative. And the audiences were supposed to feel, as we feel today, that it's funny because it's so grandiloquent. Uh, by far, however, um, the most important form of melodrama was domestic melodrama. And um, that occupies the great big middle of the 19th century. Domestic melodrama came in many different forms. The seduction of a village maiden, for example, and the wreckage of her life. Uh, by the seduction of any woman by a man of higher class who abandons her. Uh, in other words, the whole problem of illegitimate birth. Uh, the outcast fallen woman is a major, major figure in all 19th century literature and culture. What to do about that problem? And through thinking about that problem, a lot of our modern ideas of gender come into being. The travails of the poor. For example, cruel landlords demanding the rent even though you can't pay or throwing uh, deserving families out on the street, or poor people wrongly accused of a crime, and the melodrama will be devoted to their uh, trying to save their good reputation. Or problems in the family, uh, for example, disinheritance, or wrongful inheritance, that their uh, inheritance gone wrong. There'll often be a bad son and a good son one of whom is cheating the other out of his rightful inheritance. Um, alcoholism and domestic abuse. Uh, there's a whole group of melodramas called the temperance melodramas that try to frighten people out of alcohol abuse uh, because of the dreadful things it can do to a family. The perils of military service. I've already alluded to this under the heading of nautical melodrama, but it's an important feature of Domestic melodrama, too, because what happens to a family when the man has to go away to war? A lot of the melodramas focus on the woman left behind, the woman and the children left behind, and how they can manage and not manage with all the evil forces attacking them. Uh, infidelity, um, ungrateful children, hard life in the big city, problems in the empire. Maybe you can see um, in those last two that domestic can also mean urban. It doesn't just have to mean a little cottage in the countryside. Uh, domestic melodrama takes place in the heart of the big city as well. And the empire is a domestic function too. I suppose um, Barry last week showed you the slide of Queen Victoria handing the Bible. Um, to show that uh, one, of the, one of the purposes of the empire, one of the effects of the empire, was to spread domestic Englishness all over the world. So a lot of the imperial melodramas have to do with struggles in the empire. Um, here are some examples of domestic melodrama. Um, this is an illustration for The Rent Day, a melodrama by Douglas Gerald. And uh, the interesting thing about this is um, it's actually a, a painting by David Wilkie called The Rent Day. And the melodrama was a spin-off from the painting. Uh, the, um, the tableau at the beginning of Act One, and a tableau, you know, is when everybody on stage freezes into a pattern. And you can read the stage picture just like a picture. Um, the opening tableau of The Rent Day was made to look exactly like David Wilkie's painting, The Rent Day. And the closing tableau of Act One was made to look exactly like another Wilkie painting called Distraining for Rent, where you can see the villainous landlord in the middle um, torturing everyone with his hard ways. Now, the point I want to make about this, there are two points I want to make about this. One is, that kind of tableau is called a realization. When you make a tableau on the theater stage and it's supposed to look exactly like a painting, it's called a realization. And you, saw, you could see this not too long ago on Broadway in the revival of uh, Sondheim's 
um, play about, uh, sometimes musical, about um, um, blocking on his name. Pardon me? Sunday in the Park with George. Thank you. Exactly. Because at the very, uh, um, in the middle of that, they all freeze into a rendition of the Sunday at the La Grande Jade. So that's a tableau realization. That's one point. The other point is that we can prove by virtue of this kind of thing that the, uh, even the illiterate working class audience for some of these melodramas were very highly versed in visual uh, literacy. In other words, they would see uh, paintings like this in engraving form in the windows of shops all over town in this great burst of visual culture that happened in the 1830s and 40s. They would see these images and they would recognize them on the stage so they could enjoy the fact of the tableau realization. And that, um, in, uh, in short, shows a, a new form of literacy beginning, which I, I do claim that we're still using and living in. So I've named so far nautical, gothic, domestic, urban, imperial. And the last one I wanted to mention is, um, oh, here's a, a tableau in, uh, imperial melodrama from one called The Relief of Lucknow having to do with the Indian Rebellion. The last kind I want to mention is sensation melodrama, which is the melodrama of special effects. Tenements burning, railway trains heading at their victims, ice flows, uh, drownings, all kinds of special effects that um, you'd be surprised how much they could do on the 19th century stage. I'll have more to say about that in just a second. But it's really important to realize that a lot of the effects that we're used to still are quite old and venerable by now. Melodrama leads to realism on the stage. Uh, but it also leads to a form of unrealism. If you, if you think about this both ways, you'll see what I mean. It's realistic because it deals with common people in common lives, uh, going about common business and struggling in common ways. Unrealistic in the sense that it always ends with a happy ending. And we know that's not true in life, right? So what is all that about? I'd like to argue that the melodramatic ending deserves a better name it deserves to be appreciated for what it's doing, which is to try to instill a kind of social faith um, in stability in a world that's feeling very, very unstable and scary. And I think that's probably why we like it still, because it gives us the idea that poetic justice is really going to be justice in the world. Um, for example, social forces that really do buffet us back and forth are too complex to be put into any story. They're very hard to understand, and they often exert their forces on you without your will. So it's awfully easy and handy to have a villain that you can blame for all of those things that are really too complex to deal with, like poverty, systemic poverty, or the miscarriage of justice or violence, things that um, may be explainable but are not controllable. And melodramatic happy endings give their audiences a feeling of some measure of um, rational control. Now, the reason I don't think that's just silly wish fulfillment is because I I really do think that after a hundred years of melodrama, what you have is a new audience learning how to be in the modern world. And I think the melodramas have taught, had, had taught their 19th century audiences to understand how law works, to understand something about the perils of gender relations, to understand something about poverty, um, and to understand things about the empire that they did not see every day up close. 
So I think it serves and still served and still serves a really important function. Um, and I don't like to hear people dismissing um, movies by saying, oh, that's just a, an old melodrama. Because I can really feel that mechanism at work still. Peter Brooks, who is the uh, most important critic of melodrama, uh, has put it this way. He says that melodrama is charged with uncovering, demonstrating, and making operative the essential moral universe in a post-sacred era. Now, we might not agree that it's a post-sacred era, but at least in the 19th century in England, that was a question. And melodrama was invented in part to address it. We don't have tragedy any longer in the 19th century, more or less. Um, we have melodrama, which is a mixed form, a tragic middle with a happy ending. OK, now. I'd like to turn to another aspect and talk just a little bit about um, a couple of the important features of melodrama, the music and the tableau. Like everything associated with theater, melodrama uh, depends a lot on how much money is available. So the orchestra for the music could either be a lavish, full-scale orchestra with commissioned original music by, an, by a composer. Or it might just be a few musicians getting together, playing from a crib uh, book of what were called mellows. Now, mellows were type of music that fell into types. They were melodies that had a certain emotional function. For example, the furiosos were called hurry music. And they were used to accompany chase scenes or scenes of combat. The agitatos, or agits for short, were used to underscore storms and scenes of emotional distress. Andantes set off touching sentimental scenes or love scenes. And finally, tremolos, or mysteriosos, often called mists for short, accompanied scenes of apprehension, terror, or the supernatural. Here's a, um, a book uh, that reposes in the Victoria and Albert Museum, or was published by the Victoria and Albert Museum, from a discovery made in a trunk, um, now called the Cooper Folio, uh, which is a compilation of uh, melodramatic mellows. And I'll show you a couple of them in a minute. But first, a word about melodramatic tableau, because I want to be able to put the two together in a second, the music with the tableau. Uh, I described earlier what a tableau is, and you all can picture it. Um, but there were various kinds of tableau, not just the realizations where uh, the picture on the stage imitated a, a, a famous painting or, st or a statue. But um, there was the recognition tableau. And that's your, that's your basic double take, where two people suddenly see each other, recognize each other, start back from each other. And of course, you're supposed to be filled with suspense, wondering, how do they know each other? And the rest of the plot is there to let you figure that out. Um, there are domestic tableau, which are simply home scenes or sentimental scenes that are meant to show the configuration of an emotional constellation in a family. They pause for long enough for you to read the picture so that you can make conclusions about what's going on in the inner world of the characters. There's the vision scene. And that's what I want to talk about now for a minute or two. I'd like to show you a couple of vision scenes and make a few points about how they work and why they're important. This is the tableau at the end of Act I of the Corsican Brothers. And uh, I have to tell you a little bit about the plot in order to explain why this tableau is so fascinating. Um, in the Corsican Brothers, they're twins, Corsican brothers, 
And one of them has stayed behind in Corsica with his mother, while the other one has gone off to law school in Paris. So there's the country mouse and the city mouse. There's the country Corsican and the city Corsican. And they have a special form of romantic ESP, so that if either one of them is in danger of his life, the other one will feel it at that exact moment. And sure enough, at the end of Act One, the Corsican brother at home in Corsica feels a stab of pain in his chest and realizes that his Parisian counterpart is in trouble. And at the very end of the act, he points to the back of the stage next to his mother. They both turn around and look at the back of the stage where a gauze parts revealing the scene in Paris where the other brother has just been killed in a duel. Now, what's so cool about this is that it represents simultaneity in time. And it also shows you the division of the stage um, in order to, it, it shows you how a division in the stage can do that. In the first stage, you have the here and now in Corsica. And in the backstage, you have a vision of what's happening elsewhere, which everyone in the audience knows that we can't really see. So it's explained, it's, there's no rational explanation. It's given to you as the audience. Now the cool thing is, at Act 2 then goes back and excavates the plot about the duel and tries to tell us why the Parisian brother was fighting the duel. And at the end of Act 2, you have exactly the same tableau, only in reverse. In the foreground is the duel in the forest of Fontainebleau, and in the background are the people in Corsica waiting for word of what's happened to the Parisian brother. So that kind of switching effect not only manages to represent simultaneity in time, in 1852 now, montage in cinema has not been invented yet. This is montage at the very middle of the 19th century on stage. And D.W. Griffith admitted as much. He thought that Dickens had taught him the rudiments of montage. And Dickens, of course, was a fanatic for the popular theater. So it was developed here. Um, here is the ghost mist from the um, Corsican brothers. Those of you who can read music will get a tiny idea of it. What I need to do is get someone to play this for me on the violin and get a slide of the music. But it was said to be especially eerie played on the saw. <laughs> this is, um, of course, a, a, redu a reduction. It's a, not possible to play this on the piano exactly. Um, now, another vision scene I want to talk you through is from uh, a late melodrama called The Bells by Leopold Lewis. This is the playbill, which uh, it simply indicates that this was one of the big big production melodramas that um, hired an original composer to do the music. Um, again, I need to tell you a little bit about the story in order that you'll understand the brilliance of the tableau I'm about to show you. Uh, Matthias, our protagonist, uh, murdered a wealthy Jew 15 years before the play opens. He murdered the Jew in order to steal his money and the money, from, the money stolen from the Jew established him as the rich, upper-middle-class burger that he was. So he harbors a secret crime and um, is very much afraid that somebody will find out about it. Uh, and um, he goes to a mesmerist, a hypnotizer, who makes him very much afraid that his secret will come out because these guys have ways of drawing the secret out of you. Now, 15 years after the murder, to the very hour, you see, melodrama really cares about this time thing, to the very hour, um, he starts hearing sounds of the sleigh, the bells on the sleigh that the murdered Jew was riding in. The bells get louder and louder and louder. He thinks uh, they might be real. He asks people, do you hear what I hear? Nobody hears anything, except, of course, we do in the audience, because the 
orchestra is playing it. So the bells get louder and louder and louder. Nobody hears anything but us. And all of a sudden, the back of the stage opens to reveal the sleigh with the Jew that he murdered. And he sees himself stalking the Jew behind the sleigh. So he's suddenly confronted with a, with a visual representation of his crime. And it makes him reel backward in that very um, melodramatic gesture. He falls to the floor and faints, and that's the end of Act One. Oh, I forgot one important detail. At one moment, um, the Jew is absolutely stationary, and then he turns his eyes and fixes them on Matthias. So it's a vision scene with a recognition scene in the middle of it. And he shrieks at the sight of those eyes because really what's happened is the dead have come back to has come back to life. Okay, um, that, this was a, a drawing in the newspaper. And this is a, one of the, we, we didn't have photographs in the newspaper yet, so people could still see previews of court scenes uh, they could see reports of court scenes and previews of the theater this way. And here's another representation of the same exact vision scene from another paper. And they're pretty similar, so I reckon that's what it looked like. Um, this is an example of um, the music cue at the end of Act One. Uh, you probably can't read it, but it says, Q, Matthias, 10 o'clock, the very hour. And at, that, at the sound of that line, the orchestra picks up the theme of the bells pianissimo until Matthias shrieks and falls on the floor, and then they get louder and louder straight to the curtain. The point I'm making here is one that I hinted about earlier in my talk, which is that in this melodrama, the villain and the um, victim are the same person. Because Matthias has done the murder, but no one knows that. He's torturing himself with memories and a guilty conscience. And those are represented on stage by the vision tableau. So we, this, this form of theater has developed a way of showing you the inside of somebody's emotional life his interiority, and in this case, his guilt, with a visual representation of his crime. And all through the uh, melodrama, he's fighting it off, and the sound of the bells keeps repeating and repeating, until finally in Act 3, he goes to sleep and dreams that he's on trial for, for the murder of the Jew. He's convicted and sentenced to hang, and he wakes up in a frantic fright screaming, take the rope from my neck. Take the rope from my neck. And of course, there is no rope on his neck. But he dies anyway of strangulation in a great cataclysmic ending, which of course shows that his guilty conscience has tortured him to death. Uh, he dies by his own hand, you might say, or by his own mind. And it's represented on the stage and in the ambient space of the theater by the sound of the bells. So I'm just trying to show you how the technology of the, of the um, tableau and the music can go together so well. Um, I have two very brief um, clips from uh, D.W. Griffith's silent films. And I'm not going to show you all of them because there's no t not enough time left. But I want you to see this same kind of technology working in early cinema. Uh, the first clip is from uh, Broken Blossoms from 1919. And this is uh, Griffith's film about um, alcoholism and violent child abuse with Lillian Gish in the part of the abused child.
Oh, sorry. And, and this next one is a short clip from D.W. Griffith's Way Down East from 1920, which will show you just a very short part of the famous ice flow scene, again starring Lillian Gish as a woman who had had an illegitimate child because of a, a um, seduction and abandonment by an upper class guy. Um, she's trying to make her life anew. Of course, the baby died, which frees her up for a whole new life. And um, the squire is in love with her, but she can't marry him because of her fallen past. And the movie is one long uh, agony for her. That would be a sensation melodrama <laughs> in the 19th century. They were experimenting with uh, staging special effects very much like that. Of course, it's, uh, of course it's more easily graspable in cinema. But that leads me to my conclusion, which is all about how important this form is to cinema. Now, we've always known that early silent movies made use of the gestural melodramatic acting style. And we've always seen those exaggerated emotional face uh, gestures. So we know that. We knew also uh, that melodramatic music was very much like film music, in the sense that early silent films were accompanied by live music. Um, what I'd like to add to that is that if you become conscious of this, you'll also start seeing freeze frames in movies everywhere you go you'll start seeing the pause button come on or the fr fr frame freeze in a gesture that remembers the tableau. I, I swear, uh, you'll, you'll be seeing it everywhere. And it's, and it's very much more interesting once you realize that it has this long history. But secondly, I wanted to point out that if you think about the form of the film strip, you'll realize that, of course, what it is is a series of photographs of still pictures that are run together so fast in front of a light source that when they're projected against the wall or a screen, it looks like the uh, images are moving. They're moving pictures. But they're really a long series of tableau strung together. And I, I truly do believe that melodramatic tableau inspired the development of photography, and then the development of the film strip. Because if you think about a tableau um, punctuating the play all through, run it fast in your mind forward like a flip book or something. You'll see moving pictures. And of course, the pun really does make sense, because they were also very moving. <laughs> oh, but it's true. <laughs> Um, you know, TV Guide called uh, drama, television dramas, melodramas, all the way up into the 1960s. And, um, and uh, for, for, um, for all the interest of these f points about form, though, the real force of uh, melodramatic aesthetic for us today is in the, the, the force of psychological phenomena that can be imagined as external force and the sociological questions of justice for the common person. Um, and this is what melodrama has to give us. Thank you.
I'd love to. Carol will take questions if you, if you have them. Yes. That's a really great question. In fact, um, that guy I referred to, Peter Brooks, um, his book about melodrama ends with Henry James. And he, he makes the point that, um, that melodrama was pushing toward a kind of expressiveness beyond language. He calls it the text of muteness. And, and he believes that James was uh, you know, the highest point of narrative realism and that he, too, was pushing beyond language. The Turn of the Screw is a great example um, because it asks the, question, asks the question, the same question about ghosts and spirits that Gothic melodrama was asking. Are these things real or are they figments of the imagination? And it's not always so easy to answer that question, especially um, when you're in a state of agitated emotions. Now you can, can sometimes see things or feel things that other people don't feel or see. So, you know, the question is a real one. Um, but uh, another part of the answer to that question is that melodrama and the novel go hand in hand all through the 19th century. And it's one of the main things I really do want to make clear in the, in the work I'm trying to do, um, that it's, it, it's the other child of the realistic novel. It's the, it's the twin. And you can't really get a very good idea of what's going on in 19th century art and literature, I don't think, unless you kind of see that it's a shadow figure of the realist novel. Um, does that answer your question? At, at least a beginning. Yes? Well, now, see, in my judgment, it doesn't need to be rescued. <laughs> but I do, I, do, um, I do get your question. And uh, I, probably should have said, um, I probably should have said more about that, because really I was thinking of Billy Budd as a nautical story that had, that's still a part of our um, active literary canon. Um, and I, get, I would say that the concluding scenes are very melodramatic but probably not the whole story. And two, I was also thinking of the Britain opera, which melodramatizes the story significantly. I don't mean that it um, makes the story more a melodramatic story. I mean that because it's also visual and audible, it is a melodrama. And uh, by the way, you know, opera often comes from melodrama. A lot of the 19th century operas were first melodramas. And the thematic music of the melodrama uh, gets its highest expression in the Wagnerian leitmotif. Yes? It comes from this tradition, absolutely. And um, it, it almost doesn't, it doesn't keep you from being seized by it. You know, you, you still will cry or scream. Um, with the crashing chord or the cymbal crash, or uh, it still affects you even if you know that it comes from this historical tradition. But it does help us at least get a handle on it to know that it's of this long, long tradition. And these art forms have to have an effect on us. I mean, we're not living in an era of Greek tragedy or Shakespearean tragedy. We're living in an era of melodrama. And um, that's my claim anyway. So it behooves us to, to know that at least and try to see what it's doing to us, for, for better and for worse. Yes? What would you consider the difference between melodrama and opera? I'm thinking it started with Rousseau as a gothic composer, and if you think of Fidelio as a melodrama, mm -hmm. so where do they diverge and how do they affect each other? Well, opera. Uh, as in Fidelio, opera often has melodramatic scenes where 
um, the music is subtending um, spoken word rather than singing. So in the grave digging scene in Fidelio, or in the Wolf's Glen episode of Der Freischutz, or um, Mozart loved melodrama, and he wrote a he wrote he was he wrote a melodrama called Zaid. Um, loved the melodramas of Be, uh, Georg Benda, and uh, anyway, um, I would draw the line uh, between whether. Uh, it's spoken or sung. I mean, opera is mostly sung. Melodrama is mostly spoken. Now, that, that doesn't go 100%. That's not 100% accurate. Because, for example, the comic operas of Gilbert and Sullivan have spoken dialogue and then song numbers. And that gives us the musical afterward. Um, or uh, some operas. Uh, do have these moments of melodramatic spoken word. So it's not a hard and fast division. They too go along side by side in the 19th century, just like melodrama and the novel do. Maybe you could see melodrama somehow as between opera and the novel. It's, it's, not, as, it's not as high as opera, not as, uh, not as su not sung through. But it's not privatized and uh, internalized the way reading a novel would be. I don't know. That's an attempt. They're definitely related. It seems that uh, cartoons, especially for the young, are, are just based on melodrama everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's also true for the vampire story. Since you it up to the I, I know. It's really true. It, I, I'm constantly struck by how much classical music there is in, in cartoons in general, but the, the plots are very melodramatic. And uh, some people have wanted to argue that melodrama is childish, but I argue that childhood is melodramatic. <laughs> Heightened emotional states, you know, they deserve a, he a hearing. And, um, one of the things about melodrama is that, in, insofar as it tries to push beyond language, uses a lot of body language to express things that are not expressible in words. So pantomime or mute figures who literally can't talk but make themselves understood by their gestures. Uh, the, the, the point for psychology is that this is very much like hysteria, that you know, um, meant, uh, you, you can you can get sick by not being able to express yourself. And um, Freud you know, began his uh, theorization of the unconscious by reading the body language of people who were stymied and couldn't say what it was that was bothering them. So there's a, real, um, a, a really good connection from melodrama to psychoanalysis as well. OK, yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, exactly. I think um, Ibsen is is uh, um, he's highly influenced by melodrama. He's, he uses the tableau a lot. And if you think about a dollhouse, you can, um, you know, when um, when Nora uh, dances the tarantella, you can immediately realize how very silent the stage has been, except for that. Uh, he ironizes the melodramatic uh, features of melodrama. He takes them, he uses them, he shows his awareness of them, and he turns them in a new direction. And he's very much influenced by them. There's a book um, not too long ago by a, a scholar named Toro Moy, a big new book on Ibsen that has a chunk about this in it, if you're interested in following up, about Ibsen's use of melodrama. I think it's interesting that Wagner was so influenced by melodrama as well. I mean, his compositional technique was influenced by melodrama. Yes? Um, I, that, 
that's a question that speaks right to my heart. I was just arguing uh, last week to a guy who is one of the editors of the Norton Anthology of Drama. And I was arguing that it was really time for melodrama to be canonized because uh, most of them are what I would call theater rather than drama. In other words, not meant to be read. But some of them do rise to the uh, level of being readable literary pieces. And the one that I suggested for inclusion in the anthology is called The Octoroon by uh, Dion Busico. And it's a, a racial melodrama set in Louisiana um, about a, uh, a natural child, an illegitimate child born of the judge, who's now dead. And the judge's wife has taken her in as a daughter. And um, then all of a sudden, a cousin comes from Paris and falls in love with her and doesn't realize that she's an octoroon. So it raises all kinds of questions about uh, visual recognition. Like, can you tell a person's race by looking? And this really does develop the uh, whole idea about melodrama. You, you should be able to tell who, who's who just by looking. Well, you can't. Um, so it really plays fast and loose with that. And then there's a murder in this um, melodrama that happens to be caught on film by a camera, which was brand new technology. And at the end of the melodrama, at the trial, the photograph is revealed and shows who the murderer was. And that, to me, is like the melodramatic form thinking about its tableau and thinking about how photography really is doing the same kind of thing. And they call it the eye of God. It's the eye of God who, come, you know, coming down to earth to show where justice really is. But it's not. It's a camera. So I, that's that's my vote. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.